Mark Samuels Lassner is a well-known and well-regarded book collector, bibliographer, and typographer who specializes in collecting books from the late Victorian era, 1850 to 1900. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. I'd like to talk about, first of all, just briefly, your philosophy of collecting, and secondly, specifically about the publisher John Lane and the, and the Bodley Head. Well, I don't really think I have a philosophy of collecting, rather an experience of collecting now going on about 40 years. I suppose my idea of collecting is that you have to have a reason and the reason can be emotional, scholarly, financial, it can be almost unexplained reason, simply a passion, or a combination of all of them. In my case, I think the philosophy or the reason for collecting is emotional and scholarly. I love the objects, the art, the aesthetic, the literature, the personalities of the second half of the 19th century in Britain. But I have also collected because I have used the materials for my own nefarious scholarly purposes, producing bibliographies, exhibitions, articles for a variety of journals and publishers over the last 25 years, and making the materials also available to others who are interested in the period. I have fe always felt that having a collection is a responsibility. You have the things for a while, they will go on to another home or homes, and while you have them, you should make them available to others, not just say, necessarily everyone, but people who have a serious interest or need to see and use the things you have. Moreover, one of the great things about working with scholars, other collectors, booksellers, is that you develop terrific friendships, associations. I always think that wherever I go, there is someone I know or is a friend of a friend that I can call up and they may collect in a field completely different from my own. But we will have that in common as fellow collectors. That obsession, that insanity. That yeah. obsession, insanity, <laughs> and you develop a, an enormous social circle. I think that I must know only a fraction of the book people in the United States, the rare book people, but I probably know all of them with just one step removed. Well, let's look then at, at one of the most, how would you classify or characterize John Lane? Well, the Bodley Head publishing firm, which was founded as publisher in 1887 by Elkin Matthews and John Lane. They produced their first book in 1889, Richard Legallian's Volumes in Folio, was, I think, the landmark small publisher of the end of the 19th century in Britain. They published many important books and writers during the original partnership of Elkin Matthews and John Lane, which was dissolved in 1894. The two men continued as separate publishers until Elkin Matthews' death and John Lane's death, both in the 1920s. In terms of what they did, they were at the forefront of the trend of literary publishers who produced what they called books in bell let Poetry, fiction of a certain kind, non-fiction of an intellectual literary nature, books that were not necessarily popular, but important, interesting, and always beautifully produced mm -hmm. in a commercial mode. And typically in a fairly short uh, run. Yes, that yeah. was one of their brilliant ideas, which was they could buy up remnants of paper, very nice paper, that had been used for other publishers' works and use that paper to produce limited editions. And they almost, not single-handedly, but very much made the cult for limited editions that was prevalent in the 1890s. There have always been limited editions, but they weren't heavily marketed or collected. They had the collector in mind. Yes, the collector and the reader, or the reader who might become a collector, the collector who might become a reader, anyone who was attracted to this. Of course, the cynics said 
that by saying a book was printed to 250 copies probably meant that you'd actually sell a hundred more than if it had no limitation at all. They were as very shrewd marketers, very shrewd bookmakers. Lane particularly, has, you might say he was the more energetic of the partners in seeking out authors, in taking risks, than Elkin Matthews. They also employed some innovative designers. Yes, the, the books um, were designed principally by two of the great printer designers, Charles Jacobi of the Chiswick Press, or by W.B. Blakey at Constable in Edinburgh. And when I say designers, these were the men who ran the printing firms that would typeset the books and had a great hand in the design of the ordinary Elkin Matthews or John Lane books of the 1890s. But of course they also employed Charles Ricketts, the great artist, illustrator, collector, and designer to produce a number of the most brilliantly designed uh, Bodley had titles such as John Gray's Silver Points, Oscar Wilde's The Sphinx, and of course they had Aubrey Beardsley as an almost resident artist for several years, Beardsley being the art editor of the Yellow Book, published by Matthews and Lane beginning in 1894. Beardsley also produced the covers and title pages for books by Kenneth Graham, George Edgerton, John Davidson, and others, and most importantly, perhaps, he illustrated Oscar Wilde's Salome. So they had wonderful printer designers and two of the greatest book design illustrator combinations of the period. Both Ricketts and Beardsley were intimately associated in Oscar Wilde's circle, and Wilde was perhaps the most famous author, though not the best-selling author, that John Lane published in the 1890s. So if I'm a young collector who has an interest in beautifully crafted books, Bodley Head's a pretty good place to, to look then. Yes, and the price of entry is comparatively modest. There are a handful of expensive titles and a few rarities, but the bulk of the books published by the Elkin Matthews Partnership and then by Elkin Matthews and John Lane alone in the period before 1900 are, I should say, readily available. Mm. You can even find really pretty attractive copies of some of the more common books for $25, $35, $50 still. It's amazing because there have been a number of people, myself included of course, who have attempted to collect the Bodley Head output in depth. James Nelson, the historian and bibliographer of the Bodley Head, has a magnificent collection, which is now at Columbia University. I have a pretty substantial collection, and a number of friends of mine do too, and there are still plenty of these books in circulation. They're not all elaborate, illustrated volumes. Many are very attractive books of slim poetry with some type ornaments or perhaps a very simple cover design, but they are found. And I think of the roughly 100, 102 Elkin Matthews John Lane publications before the dissolution of the original partnership, my guess is that 40 or 50 of them could easily be found for sale, and most of them costing less than a couple of hundred dollars. Of course, there are also, for some of them, large paper, mm -hmm. Japan vellum issues, which, of course, adds to the interest for collectors because they're not just books. There are limits. Within these limited editions, there are super limited editions. Uh, those might be more difficult to find. And then at the other extreme are the handful of iconic titles, the Beardsley Salome, the French edition of Salome, which was co-published by... Elkin Matthews and John Lane in London, and by a French publisher in Paris. Wilde's The Sphinx, which is certainly the most expensive, though not the rarest, Bodley Head title. John Gray's Silver Points and William Strang's The Earth Fiend would all be quite expensive books today. But that is a handful, and the vast majority of them are not in that league, but they're wonderful books to have.
Now, what exactly, other than the production value, let's say, and the quality of the paper, what is it that makes them such wonderful books to have? Well, it's partly the aesthetic of the books. They are, many of them, small, beautifully produced, but there's also the content, mm. which we book collectors tend to forget about in our enthusiasm for the physical object. Some of the books were of enormous literary importance at the time. Mm -hmm. A good example is a volume of short stories, Keynotes, by George Edgerton, pseudonym of Mary Chavalita Dunn, which is one of the first works of fiction by an English new woman. This was a radical feminist view of the world. It was, shall we say, more forthcoming, more open on sexual matters than much of the fiction of its time. It was a controversial book. It was a bestseller. And it did so well that Lane introduced a keynote series of novels and books of short stories that ran to 33 volumes from 1894 to 1897. This was a really modern series. That about 20 of the books had covers by Beardsley, the rest by a Beardsley imitator named Pat Wilson. Pat Wilson? Patton. Patton, Patton Wilson. Wilson. The writers included a number of other important new women, such as Ella Darcy, uh, Netta Searitt, Una Taylor. Perhaps these are not major names, but they were quite important in their day. There were two other novels by Grant Allen, including the bestseller The Woman Who Did, which was the story of a woman who decides deliberately to have an illegitimate child, which was pretty amazing stuff for 1895. And this series itself is highly collectible and is described by Michael Sadler as the most elegant fiction series of the 19th century. So there's some books with very significant content as well mm. as their physical presence. But the physical presence, were there nicely designed initials, for example, at the beginning of each chapter? There or? are sometimes initials. There's a lot of florons. In my own typography, I have occasionally <coughs> stolen ideas from the John Lane publications to the point where others have told me to remove a lot of little type ornaments because there were too many of them. <laughs> uh, uh, there are wonderful uses of space. Mm. One of the things that Lane and Elkin Matthews did was they discovered that you could take a very small amount of poetry by a young poet and spit it out to many more pages by adding a lot of leading in the books. Another way for them to save money because it costs... Even less it. for typesetting, yeah. absolutely. Then there's a book such as Lionel Johnson's Poems, which is actually an Elkin Matthews book, but originally was to be published by the partnership, designed by Herbert Horn, which is an extraordinarily elegant piece of typography with ornaments and small capitals and all kinds of things in it. And they actually changed the typesetting for the ordinary edition of the book after the limited edition of 25 special copies was printed. What about uh, books with illustrations that they produced? Typically they would come out with, with an edition and then, I say 20 years later, they'd come out with an illustrated version of it. Yes. Lane was very careful about his copyrights so that he could publish a book by Max Beerbohm, The Happy Hypocrite, in 1897 and retain the copyright and produce illustrated editions of the book in 1915 and 1918. Even the successor firm of the Bodley had produced another edition as late as the 1940s because they still have the copyright to it. The same is true for Kenneth Graham's The Headswoman, books by Stephen Phillips, others where they just kept printing them out in new illustrated versions. Lane, in the late 1890s, in the early part of the 20th century, became a specialist in art books as well as illustrated books. And so even more of them have illustrations after that period. But the books of the early 90s, many of them will have illustrations. A lot of them have a frontispiece that 
portrait of the author, as in the case of The Art of Thomas Hardy by Lionel Johnson, which has an etching, an original etching by William Strang of Hardy as the frontispiece. Other books have highly decorated title pages by various artists, not only Beardsley, but other figures of the period. There are also the books you could call that are really just illustrations, like William Strang's The Earth Fiend, which is a series of original etchings with a poem by the artist. Beardsley Salome, of course, has the very famous illustrations, a very plain cover in contrast to the elaborate frontispiece title page and illustrations in the book. Charles Ricketts provided illustrations for a number of Bodley had publications. I like to think of Lord de Tabley's poems, Dramatic and Lyrical, which has a frontispiece and a number of illustrations very much derived from the work of the Pre Raphaelites, mm -hmm. uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti in particular. It also has a beautiful cover. Beautiful it? cover by Ricketts. Mm -hmm. So some of the books are very elaborate and some are very plain. They make a very nice collection. They're talking about keynotes. Yeah. All of the all of the the Bodley Head books of the of the nineties. Though after the breakup of the firm and after the Oscar Wilde trials, in which John Wayne was tangentially involved, um, yeah. because the trials involved the testimony of the Bodley Head's office boy, a young man named Edward Shelley. Wilde referred to how the fact that he had a very beautiful name, who seems to have been among the young men that Wilde consorted with. It was also the fact that Wilde was reported to have been carrying a yellow book. Yes, but it, but it, it wasn't it, a yellow book. No, but the, yellow book. but the story, perhaps apocryphal, is that a crowd threw rocks at the window of the Bodley Head, home of the Yellow Book magazine. I've actually never found absolute evidence that this took place, though every book about the British 1890s says it did. I think it's one of those myths that people believe. There, there are a lot of myths in the world of literature, and especially in book collecting, books that are supposedly suppressed by the authors, which survive in remarkable, remarkable numbers. But Lane's publishing style, while he always had some attractive books, he began to move into what one might call more mainstream fiction and more conservative modes, and the physical appearance of the books changed for a lot of them. He was less willing to spend money on hiring designers such as Lawrence Hausman, Ricketts, mm -hmm. or Beardsley, and the books have a more typical in-house style. This is in the late 1890s. In some cases, the typesetting is farmed out to less prestigious firms than the Chiswick Press or Constables. What about Elkin Matthews? Did he continue with his attention to the quality and the attractiveness? Yes, yes. As opposed I, to Lane? Well, I think Elkin Matthews continued more of the kind of 1890s aesthetic than Lane did. Elkin Matthews he was a much smaller publisher. Lane's publishing firm grew and became very successful commercially. Elkin Matthews remained a much more modest affair. Many of the books he issued were published on commission, meaning the authors paid for the cost of publication. Though he went on to publish Joyce, mm -hmm. uh, Yeats. Yeats, Ezra Pound, mm -hmm. and uh, what seems every bad poet who had 35 or 50 pounds to spend on a book between 1898 and 1915. But his books still continue to be more attractive in their aesthetic design. But again, he also, like Lane, began to produce plainer volumes than some of the ones of the early 1890s. Elkin Matthews was also a bookseller. He had started out as an antiquarian bookseller and continued to be a bookseller uh, for the rest of his career as well. Lane went entirely into publishing. So you're then suggesting that the, the best period to collect then would be 1887 to 1895? I think so, though you could do well to collect some of the later books as examples 
particularly of the authors that Lane and Elton Matthews had started publishing earlier on or who were associated with the Yellow Book. For instance, Max Beerbohm's works of 1896 or The Happy Hypocrite of 1897 are very nice books, not inexpensive, but very, you know, certainly easy to find. In the case of Beerbohm, he was himself very concerned with the typography and appearance of his books. Though he is not credited as the designer and he uh, portrayed himself as ignorant of the fine points of printing and bookmaking, he actually was quite an expert. So he might be an author that you'd want those first two or three books published by John Lane. Again, an author like Kenneth Graham, you could collect the first book, which is Pagan Papers, which has a Beardsley title page. And then there are the later books published by John Lane, The Golden Age, which is rather plain, and Dream Days, which has a cover design by Charles Robinson, um, and those are from the later 1890s. I, of course, have tried to collect all of the Matthews and Lane publications. I think after 30 years, I have perhaps 96 of the 101 or 102. James Nelson lists 100 in his checklist, to his book, The Early 90s, but at least two more books have turned up with Elkin Matthews and John Lane, their name on the title page, which was Nelson's criteria for inclusion. Just then, in winding down, you've mentioned a number of books that have got exceptional covers. I wonder if you could give us some of your favorite book covers, and then also some of your favorite illustrated books keeping in mind that uh, we have a limited budget. Well, Keynotes and the other volumes in the Keynotes series, because of the Beardsley covers and title pages, mm -hmm. are exceptional. Keynotes particularly, because it's the first in the series, it was issued as an experiment as a paperback first, 500 copies, and then as a hardcover. The hardcover is much easier to find than the paperback. That is, I think, a very beautiful book. The Beardsley design is imaginative. It shows a kind of slightly risque woman, his usual kind of little putos. Uh, there's a little puto playing a guitar. It's, it's completely fanciful. And the design fits the tall, narrow shape of the book. It's a little thinner than you'd expect the book to be. That's a feature of many of the early Elkin Matthews John Lane books is they have this uh, shape. They're a little octavos, but they're narrower uh, and somewhat smaller sometimes than what a more commercial publisher might produce. Other books that I think have lovely covers, well, any of the ones by Lawrence Hausman. There's Sister Songs and Poems by Francis Thompson, Cuckoo Songs by Catherine Tynan, E. Nesbitt's A Pomander of Verse that have very simple, elegant designs by Hausman, and also, of course, Hausman title pages and illustrations. So those are ones I think the covers are very, very appealing that I would want. And then, of course, there are the number of books that have unusual cover designs. Le Gallien's Volumes in Folio is bound with a parchment spine and blue-gray boards and a paper label harking back to an early 19th century, even an 18th century style of binding. Uh, there are, of course, the Ricketts ones, of course, which are wonderful. Mm. John Gray's Silver Points, the Tabley's Poems, Oscar Wilde's Poems, which is, in fact, a reissue of an earlier book published in 1892. That's a very expensive book today because only 220 signed copies were published. Another example of the canny business ability of John Lane, he discovered that the unsold sheets of Wilde's 1881 book were still lying at the binders, bought the 220 sets of sheets, and commissioned Charles Ricketts to provide a new title page and papers and cover design, mm -hmm. producing a new book which was in fact more than a decade old. 
Well, what about illustrators then, or bo uh, bodily head books? I know that they did, this may have been a bit later, but they published a lot of uh, Anatole France's works. I wonder if there are any volumes that particularly appeal to you with illustrations in them. There are some unusual things that one might find. There are books illustrated by uh, people like Walford Graham Robertson, uh, Charles Robinson, a number of the Sirret sisters, Mabel Dermer, a lot of turn-of-the-century illustrators, artists produced work for the Bodley Head that little known. One can all see the books listed in catalogs where the seller doesn't know who designed the covers. Beardsley's successor as a principal illustrator for John Lane, uh, Patton Wilson, actually was very capable, and his work is often mistaken for Beardsley's own. Mm -hmm. He produced a whole lot of illustrated books for the Bodley Head anthologies and volumes of verse in the late 1890s. There's also books such as Scholar Gypsies by John Buchan, his second regularly published book, which has title page etchings and a cover by D.Y. Cameron. That's a kind of sleeper. Buchan people know the book, but book illustration people don't. Finally, I wonder if you could identify for us the American equivalent of John Wayne. I think there are two, and they were publishers directly imitated of the what the Bodley Head was doing. Copeland and Day in Boston and Stone and Kimball in Chicago, or rather two. Copeland and Day was the American issuer of the Yellow Book magazine from 1895, I think, to its end in 1897. They also co-published a number of Matthews and Lane and John Lane and Elkin Matthews books, including Salome and the Sphinx by Oscar Wilde. There are a very few cases where the Bodley had imported American books, none of the Copeland and Days that I can remember. A Copeland and Day published books that were modeled to some extent on the Bodley Head titles. There are a very few Copeland and Day books which have a resonance in terms of literature today. Perhaps the most famous book that they published was The Black Riders, a very thin poem by Stephen Crane mm. with a cover by Will Bradley. That is perhaps the most famous Copeland and Day book. Stone and Kimball was a larger operation in Chicago, and after it folded, uh, Herbert Stone continued as a publisher in New York. They issued the chapbook called a semi-monthly, a little pamphlet-like magazine that often included contributions from figures such as Max Beerbohm in its pages. It was a very Anglophile little magazine, kind of an equivalent of the Yellow Book, but much smaller in scale. They also produced, and I'm sorry to say I can't recall the name of it, the very first literary daily newspaper in the United States which lasted for, I think, something like three weeks. <laughs> Not everything these publishers did was a success. There are very good bibliographies of both Copeland and Day and Stone and Kimball. I know a very dedicated collector of Copeland and Day, and I know a couple of people who have tried to collect all the Stone and Kimball books. It would be a wonderful thing, very representative of the time, to have collections of, say, the two American publishers mm. and the two British publishers, Elkin Matthews and John Lane, together and separate. It'd be quite a, a showstopper to have good collections of all four. And of course, the authors uh, are common to the different publishers, so that you could find Francis Thompson published by John Lane and by, you know, co-published by Copeland and Day, you could find 
with different or the same illustrators? Were there they would be cases? they would be different they yeah. would be different bindings of the same books. Mm. The inside would the be plates the same. Were the same then. Pla not only the plates, the sheets were the same. Okay. Sent over from England to the United States. Right. Okay. But you could find some interesting variations. For instance, Richard Le Gallienne wrote a book called Robert Louis Stevenson, An Elegy and Other Poems. The English edition is in blue cloth, has a frontispiece by Wilson Spear, Portrait of Le Gallienne. The American edition, published by, I think, Copeland and Day, is uh, got a title page by, I think, Will Bradley, and is in gray boards. It's a completely different book, total different typesetting, different design, everything about it except the basic text. Thanks very much for your time. I'm happy to talk about something I love to collect. I've been speaking with Mark Samuels Lastner, renowned book collector, bibliographer, and typographer. Thanks again. Good.